today's agenda, where the biome comes from and the causes of leaky gut and dysbiosis. Now, hopefully this doesn't feel like the fire hydrant opening on you, uh, but, um, but it might. <laughs> Get ready. Okay, so our original inoculation as far as where our microbiome comes from. Now, I picked this picture on purpose because if you look at that little young person, that little baby there, um, he, she, uh, we'll call it she, I don't know. She's covered with uh, all of this stuff. Um, and that's how we're born. You know, when we, we have a normal birth process, we get, uh, literally, we get our, our first significant dose or inoculation of our microbiota from passing through the vaginal canal and getting it from our mom. So the health of our early microbiome is really dependent on the health of our mother's uh, microbiome. There's some study or research now that says, um, that shows us actually that what we used to think was true, which is that uh, the um, baby is born sterile before they pass through the vaginal canal, actually is not true, in that the placenta has its own microbiome as well. But that's not a large uh, inoculation. So the first sort of significant or major one that sets the foundation, really. And um, fundamentally, this actually, because it's the first major inoculation, it, it fundamentally sets the foundation for our microbiome, really for our whole life. Now, there's things we can do, lifestyle habits, and, and some of the things we'll talk about that can alter that um, in a variety of ways. But... Uh, but um, Hold on one second here. Now you can see me. Hi. Okay. So, um, but really, it lays the foundation. So it sort of points at the importance. And, and, you know, a lot of you who are parents, you know, you already have kids now. Maybe some of you are planning to have more in the future to understand that you want to do everything you can to uh, make sure that the mother, even before pregnancy, has the best gut health she possibly can because we get that um that first inoculation that way. And then also something that is actually uh, becoming well known to do is um, uh, like a vaginal swab for a C-section birth, because obviously in a C-section, you miss out on that transit through the vaginal canal to get that inoculation. So um, in more progressive birth centers and hospitals, they actually do a swab like a uh, of the, the whole vaginal canal area and wipe it on the baby's face so they at least get some of that initial inoculation. So that's where uh, our microbiome comes from in the first place. And I put this one in here, this multi-generational family, because it, remarkably so, if you think about that, if your first inoculation, if your major, the major foundation for your microbiome is set uh, by being born and you're getting it from your mother, then what we often will see when we're working with a kid who has symptoms like eczema or ADHD or Asperger's or uh, on the autism spectrum or any number of things is that if you track back generationally, their mother will have had some symptoms, maybe something different, maybe irritable bowel syndrome, maybe their own you know, autoimmune presentations like eczema and allergies. Um, and then if you track to the maternal grandmother, also you see, but maybe less so. So maybe some digestive troubles or acid reflux or, you know, had a, a easily upset stomach and those type of things. So you, you actually can track, and, and maybe some of you can do this with your own family if you think about it, that the gut biome or the health of the gut gets passed down maternally from mother to child, from mother to child. And so it's if it started off being uh, somewhat out of balance or unhealthy, like in this case, in the grandmother, the woman on the left, that then she passes a not balanced microbiome to her daughter, the woman in the middle, who then lives in our modern world. And, uh, and it, you know, in this case, doesn't do anything to specifically correct that and then passes down an even worse situation to her daughter. And that's in part why we see a lot of chronic illnesses hitting our kids now that we didn't used to see until they got older or we didn't used to see at nearly the same level of frequency. Um, and then after the birth process, the next place where we get a lot of our microbiome from is this, from uh, breastfeeding. And it turns out that for kids that are born C-section, uh, getting the, the vaginal swab is really, really helpful. It doesn't do quite the same 
as actual full-on vaginal birth, but that if breastfeeding is done exclusively for the first year and then kept up for three years, that that can make up for a lot of the loss of microbiome that the baby got from having been C-section instead of birthed naturally or vaginally. Um, there's, first of all, there's just micro, uh, you know, bacterias and, and funguses and stuff in the breast milk, but also there's specific prebiotics, uh, so fibers in, uh, that our microbiome use to grow with. That, that it's like food for the for the bacteria, and breast milk has the specific kind of food for you know the, some of those beneficial bacteria we talked about yesterday, the lactobacilli, the um, and the bifida and all that stuff. And so what we know is that a, as makes sense, you know, when we follow sort of the natural progression of how we're design how we're built as um, humans, as animals, you know, babies born vaginally, baby breastfeeds, that the, all of these things build one on the other to help build a healthy system. So very vital to early life uh, building of the microbiome. And again, like I said, for a C-section birth, um, even more so important, well, they're both important, but actually if, if kept up for um, at least three years, it can make up for the most of the loss that happened from the C-section in terms of the microbiome. So that's, so we have birth, that's the first one, and then we have this early life and infancy. Breastfeeding is the most important thing. Um, and then once we hit, you know, toddlerhood and then the next phase of life, uh, these kind of things become the most important. So whether we live in a in world where we are trying to kill all the germs and microbes, this is a an antibacterial wipe here, or whether this is more like what our life is like as we're uh, a young person. That goes a long way to determining the health of our microbiome because if you remember from yesterday, for those of you who watched that, and if not, make sure you go back and check that one out because that's where we dive deep into uh, dysbiosis and leaky gut and what they are. Um, but what we know is that one of the biggest, if not the biggest factor in, in determining the health of our microbiome is the um, diversity of microbes. And so what a great place to find a diversity of bacteria and funguses than in a mud puddle in the backyard, getting in there, getting dirty, getting it all over our face, and this kid probably is eating some mud. All that stuff is good. So those are the type of things once we you know, become kids, once we're past breastfeeding uh, and into being a kid in the world, these type of things make a big difference. Whether we try to sterilize our world or whether we uh, go with uh, nice, healthy exposure to a variety of microbes. All right, so here's some other things that can play. So being around pets and exposure to other animals. Um, you might have heard that you know kids who grow up on farms or with pets and animals have less allergies. Uh, and you know, sort of the general idea is how you're exposed to it, so you don't amount to an immune response. But there's a big reality to, to that this is uh, expanding the um, the scope of your microbiome because each animal has different microbiome. And then you think about a dog that runs around outside, you know, rolls in who knows what, what kind of microbial life they're bringing home that you get to have exposure to and increase your diversity. This is one of the most potent ways for kids, adults, and so on and so forth to um, increase and, and the diversity and increase the health of their microbiota. And that's getting your hands in the soil, especially if it's healthy soil, especially if it's organic soil, hasn't been sprayed with artificial um, stuff that they do for farming, <laughs> herbicides and pesticides and, and uh, chemical fertilizers and so forth. You know, if you've been composting or, or get composted soil, getting out there, getting your hands in the soil, picking weeds and having that smell of the fresh earth, all of that is, is bountiful microbial life. Just spending time in nature. You know, we talked about that first day that our gut, really, our microbiome system starts with our sinuses. And so being out in nature, breathing through our nose, having a variety of exposures to just the natural world. Because, you know, again, if you think about how we existed as creatures on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years before now, we spent all of our time outside in close proximity and relationship with all these plants and the soil and other animals and so on and so forth. So... Uh, it's really a big part of what we need to do is reconnect to that reality. 
And then fermented foods here, these are fermented foods. Um, those are also important, especially what they call wild ferments, which happens if you ferment it yourself. And then you have to, if you try to buy fermented foods, you want to make sure that they're wild fermented. That means there's a, a broad scope of wide variety of microbial life in those things that you eat. Uh, and that helps foster a good, healthy, diverse e ecosystem in your gut. So, so that was the quick version of where our microbiome comes from in the first place. Uh, there's a couple other pieces that I'm going to jump, just kind of touch on before we jump to the next section, which is where did things go wrong, is um, that it's, it's right now understood that that initial inoculation we get at birth, whether it's through the vaginal canal or whether it's unfortunately the microbiome, you know, the hospital surgical unit, really there's a foundational um, foundation that gets put in place and our lifestyle habits absolutely have a big effect on it but there is something too that what we found the reality that that no matter what you do in your life beneficial or harmful to your microbiome that that initial exposure that initial foundation stays and it's speculated or understood that um, that in large part gets um, stored in the appendix, like we were talking about that first day when we were looking at the structures. And so um, it's vital, 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 it, if possible, you know, for people you know, if you have more kids, if your kids have kids, to understand how vital that is, that initial bacterial inoculation. And that's why in, you know, the more progressive or forward-thinking birthing scenarios, they do the vaginal swab even if they have to or think they have to do a C-section. So, and then breastfeeding is super vital as far as that goes too. Um, so there you go. Okay, so where do things go wrong? So now we're going to talk about what what causes leaky gut. Like where, do, what the heck, you know, why, why are we seeing this? And not only why are we seeing this, why are we seeing this in our kids? Why are we seeing this in our kids so young? Why are we seeing this in our kids even if, you know, we eat a healthy diet? Because, you know, I get this question sometimes. It's like, okay, well, everything you're saying about leaky gut sounds like it makes sense. You know, the symptoms, the, you know, all the different ways we might know if that's possibly what's going on. But why would my kid have a leaky gut? Because we eat healthy, um, we eat lots of fruits and vegetables, you know, maybe they haven't had that many uh, exposures to antibiotics, so on and so forth. So why uh, do we still have that? So remember, uh, I like this picture, so I'm putting it back up. Remember that our gut ecosystem operates like this diverse forest and the, with the plants acting as our microbiome and the soil is, is like our gut lining. So the health of the system is dependent on the variety of the plants in various states of life. So some new, some dead, some decaying to create a healthy biome of soil to nourish and strengthen the entire system. So just keep that picture in mind and the diversity reality of it, okay? So this is a, uh, an image of a C-section. We mentioned that already, but um, it's a different initial exposure. So this is it can be one of the first places where things went wrong in terms of making it more likely to have had uh, a leaky gut type of situation, dysbiosis, so on and so forth. Um, even when we do everything else right, like a, a vaginal swab and breastfeeding, it still can set the stage for other things. So in most cases also, let me just back up and say, in most cases, it's not just going to be one of these events that causes it. Now it can be. It can be one extreme or you know significant event and all the rest are fine. But it's, it's like most things. It's a number of stresses that build upon each other to lead to a situation where we have enough dysbiosis and um, increased permeability or leaky gut that we start causing serious uh, problems in the in the person, in the kid, in the in the you, whoever it is, in their body. So here's another early life exposure vaccines. Uh, right now, kids that are born now, like my kids' age, uh, my youngest is three. If to get a the full series of vaccines, by the t if she got them, you know, on schedule, by the time she would be 18, she'd have had 76 doses 
um, of vaccines. And now every vaccine by design has um, chemicals and, and different preservatives and things in there that uh, basically confuse, activate, overactivate, and are toxic to our gut microbiome and to our immune system. And so it throws things very out of whack. And this is, you know, speculated to be a big part of why we're seeing so much of a rise in autoimmunity and, you know, the autism spectrum and ADHD and all kinds of other problems amongst our young people because they're getting such an onslaught of uh, these toxic chemicals. You know, and they took mercury out of most of the childhood vaccines, but uh, as such had to add more aluminum in. And aluminum is also a potent neurotoxin and is toxic to our microbiome as well. So these are antibiotics, and we talked about that a little bit yesterday with uh, the effects. But if you think about, I mean, literally what an antibiotic is, is a, is a drug or a chemical whose job it is to kill um, bacteria. And so every exposure to antibiotics does uh, is destructive to our microbiome. And that's not to say, you know, that one dose is going to set you up for chronic health problems the rest of your life or anything like that. But the use of antibiotics is way out of balance, and, and um, I think people are starting to wake up to maybe we're using them too much. You know, we hear about superbugs and all that kind of stuff. But still, they're given uh, very frequently. And so uh, um, I believe that the number, la was it last year or the year before, that in terms of antibiotic prescriptions, oh no, it was, I think it was 2015, that for every 1,000 people of the U.S. population, there were 800 and about 850 prescriptions written for antibiotics. So that means 85% of the population uh, had at least one, you know, had a, a, a prescription for antibiotics. Now, of course, some people had more than one, but, uh, but every successive uh, round of antibiotics you're on in the course of the year increases the damage. And it's also not just like it goes in there and, wipes everything out like well, if we went back to that forest it's not like it it goes in there and just eradicates everything what actually ends up happening is each antibiotic has certain organisms that it kills and certain organisms that they leave behind um, and in in almost every case antibiotics only kill bacteria and don't kill fungi which we have a huge amount in our gut and so often that's one of the first things that happens um, is that you know our fungus gets out of balance so what happens is they selectively kill certain strains of bacterias, and so other ones start taking their place. And more than just wiping everything out, what actually it ends up happening is antibiotic use and, and chronic or ongoing antibiotic use causes for a pushing of further and further and further out of balance of our diverse ecosystem and having it become more and more monoculture, which is very destructive to the health of our body and makes it that much harder to bring things back into balance later. Because if you just wiped everything out, then it would all sort of have a chance to come back in equal footing, you know, where our appendix would shoot that, you know, initial inoculation back into the system and everything would grow happy. But, but that's not how it happens. They end up just wiping out selective species. And so um, it makes, it's like, you know, other ones gain, gain a foothold. And it's like when there's invasive species in, in an ecosystem. Like where I live, we have scotch broom. And, you know, when you find like scotch, like in the, in a diverse, healthy forest here in the Pacific Northwest, you don't see a lot of scotch broom taking over, uh, because the forest is so diverse, there isn't room for it to get a foothold. But if you go anywhere where they've been logging or they've cleared an area, then there's tons of scotch broom. And right now we see it everywhere because it's in bloom. So there's these bright yellow flowers. And so as you drive through different rural, I live out in the boonies, so I drive through a lot of rural areas. And if there's areas that have been, you know, logged or whatever the case may be that nobody's doing anything with now, so they've been selectively, you know, certain trees were killed or whatever, it's just covered with scotch broom now. This invasive species takes over. It's very much the same in our microbiome. All right, back to that picture. So living in a overly sterilized world is a huge problem to our healthy microbiome. If we are constantly uh, trying to sanitize and detoxify or, uh, you know, kill bacteria with wipes and, you know, you go to every grocery store, it seems like now, um, or at least the major grocery stores, you know, out front, they have the, the 
uh, these things that you can wipe your cart down with because heaven forbid you actually touch something that another human touched and um, you know the antibacterial soaps and kids are walking around you know moms with their diaper bags have the the stuff you know wiping on their kids hands every 10 seconds you know you don't want to get any germs and what we're finding out as we start to actually understand how it works that this is like completely the opposite of how our health works and completely illogical once you understand how it all works but you know i don't uh, fault these people necessarily because it's what they've been taught that that's how you keep your kids or yourself from getting sick but the more we do this the more we start to kill off uh, again, selectively bacterias, and you know, then we have resistant bugs that aren't affected by these things, or you know, we have the the MRSA and all that stuff. And and this is a large part the over sanitized, over sterilized world. This right there is another cause of leaky gut. That is fluoridated toothpaste. So fluoride is a potent, potent neurotoxin. Um, it's listed as such and you know whatever the fda's chemical database it's when you have fluoride as a uh, product of industrial like if you're making some industrial product and fluoride is one of the the byproducts that come out of it it, it is very expensive to take care of because it's so toxic to deal with so fluoride um, in our toothpaste and fluoride in municipal water is uh, very damaging to our gut microbiome. Uh, water even more so, right, because you're drinking it in. Ideally with you know, toothpaste, at least you're spitting it out, but you certainly get some absorption and some exposure every time you use that. These are over-the-counter medications, so ibuprofen, so NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, very damaging i don't know this is actually the first time the first thing i ever heard about leaky gut years ago i didn't even get what it meant or what the implications were uh that nsaids non steroidal anti-inflammatories that was the first time i'd ever heard about it like oh that's one of the problems with if you take too much ibuprofen you get leaky gut and uh, i remember thinking about it at the time and thinking well leaky gut that doesn't sound so bad you know like what's the big deal you know i'm thinking like an ulcer you know that's leaky gut like no big deal. Had no idea the implications. I mean, I think nobody really did, but uh, people certainly who were forerunners in the field had some sense of it and at least had coined the term. So ibuprofen, um, all of the, the non steroidal anti inflammatories, aspirin, Aleve, all that stuff uh, directly affects and attacks our gut lining um, and the health of our gut lining as well as our microbiota. So too does Tylenol, though it attacks different ones. Now, this is sort of um, one of those kind of odd things in a sense, but it makes sense also. So this is a, you know, an antibacterial uh, drug this is that this guy is not wanting to take, but taking because, you know, he's having digestive issues. But if you think about it, if you get some imbalance going on in your gut, leaky gut, dysbiosis, often some of the first symptoms are digestive symptoms, right? Either um, chronic diarrhea, constipation, stomach pains, indigestion, acid reflux, all of these things are often early signs of things. Out, well, they're all signs of things being out of balance in your digestive system, but they're often the early signs of that before we maybe get to neurologic symptoms or autoimmunity. But the problem here with this picture is that taking these things to mute the symptoms actually is destructive to the microbiome itself. So any of these things that we take, the anti-diarrheal drugs, um, the next picture is uh, antacids, uh, very uh, damaging to our microbiome because the way they work is they change the environment. So antacids, right, they change it to make it a less acidic environment, but that just throws things further out of balance uh, because typically, for example, you know, with these and, and acid reflux, it's not a problem of having too much acidity, it's having a it's a problem of having things out of balance that's now causing for this reflux. And so then if we work against our body's own attempts to correct things, we, uh, we actually push the system further and further out of balance. So those things, so taking antidiarrheals, taking in acids, um, are very harmful to our microbiome. This is a municipal water plant. So back to what I was saying about the fluoridation, but even if you don't have fluoride in your water, which hopefully you don't, um, there's also chlorine 
And the reason they put chlorine in water, it, it's, it's important. And it's actually the, I mean, not to get too far off topic here, but you know, uh, a lot of those communicable diseases that vaccines get the credit for eradicating were actually eradicated by this very thing that we started doing uh, proper water treatment and killing the pathogenic uh, microbes that were in water from like, you know, fecal matter and stuff. But at the same time, chlorine kills bacteria. So there's not as much left when it gets into your glass. If you pour a glass of water out of the tap or, you know, showering or whatever, but there is some still. And so that gets into your system. You absorb it through your skin in terms of a shower or bath. You drink it. If you drink the water or cook with it and you're getting chlorination and that is, that's what chlorine does. That's why it works to sanitize the water in a water sanitation treatment plant, but it also sanitizes the inside of your body, which can be very harmful. And the same thing happens when you're in a swimming pool full of chlorinated water. Um, a lot of people have reactions to chlorinated water. Their skin gets itchy. Well, their phone is ringing over there. Um, I, I have a tough time with it. But not only do you get it you know, in the water, absorbing through your skin, but there's this layer of chlorine gas that floats around above the water um, you know, before it dissipates, especially in indoor pools even more so because it doesn't have as good ventilation as if you're outdoor. So this can cause for gut dysbiosis, swimming in chlorinated water, uh, certainly, the more frequently you do it, the more effect it's going to have. But um, I always knew there was something wrong with chlorinated pools because being around them always gave me a sore throat and a, an itchy skin. And so I, I pretty much have just stopped going in them and really don't even like being near them before I even understood how they affected my gut microbiome. And then pollution in uh, the air. So this is, you know, there's carcinogens and heavy metals from... Uh, you know, car exhaust and industrial pollution and, and our air just, and actually, um, we'll get to it, but herbicides, pesticides are in the air. So we're constantly breathing in, um, stuff that is harming our microbiome and, uh, killing certain bacteria and fungi and stuff like that. So this is a picture of mostly grains. I see there's some chickpeas in there, but, um, and I guess popcorn, but the idea was, uh, grains. So eating grains, um, and particularly glutinous grains, in, uh, in specifically, but not not only, but mostly glutinous grains. So wheat is the most common one, barley, rye, um, causes for inflammation in our gut. That the the process of our body trying to digest and break down these so-called foods um, literally causes for inflammation at the lining of the gut. And what we know now, because you know, we're still looking at how gluten sensitivity, gluten allergies, celiac disease, how those things all interrelate to our gut microbiome. But what we do know is that when our gut lining is inflamed, that's not good. And that's not good for our microbiome, and that's not good for the function of our gut lining, and leads to a leaky gut situation. And there are researchers in the field of gluten and leaky gut and so forth that will tell you that um, there are studies, I'm not saying like they're suspicious, but I mean, I've heard this, that there are, there's some studies when they measure, there's a particular a series of antibodies that get formed if you are like gluten intolerant when you eat gluten. Um, but that when they test people who don't have celiac disease, that a hundred percent of people have formation of antibodies when they eat gluten, which tells me that you know, for better or for worse, our body doesn't perceive gluten containing grains as food. Uh, it, it sees it as an antigen. It's also antigenic and causes inflammation, like I said, so it leads to more leaky gut at the gut lining. Uh, and then, you know, there's a whole cascade of things that happen there. When things are out of balance with your microbiome, you don't digest the proteins in wheat. And, and it's the same thing actually in, in dairy as well. And so if you've heard about uh, gliadomorphines and caseomorphines, what happens is, and this is a little tangent, so I won't go too deep into this, but um, when you eat uh, wheat, gluten, uh, the gluten is a protein. It needs to get broken down first in our stomach with the acidic environment like we've talked about, and then pancreatic enzymes. But when our gut is in dysbiosis, it doesn't break those proteins down enough. So then they, and when we have leaky gut, they get absorbed through the system as polypeptides, things that are too big 
for that are, that aren't supposed to be getting in there. And those are very similar to morphine, um, the, the drug morphine. And so actually people who develop this leaky gut and then uh, consume wheat and or dairy from cows and get the casein um, actually get a drug effect like morphine, believe it or not. So that's one. And then we got the big one. Um, and this is a person spraying Roundup on some crops. And how do I know it's Roundup? I don't know if it's Roundup, but I do know that it is very, very likely that whether that's the brand name Roundup or not, that what's coming out of there, the active chemical is what's called glyphosate. So glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, and it came off patent, I believe, in 1997. So since then, just about every herbicide that's used in farming and agriculture, landscaping, everywhere has uh, glyphosate. Um, so glyphosate is a big problem. And I saved it for last out of that whole list because of the many, many ways that it interferes with our normal microbiome. So much so that, you know, if you could just eliminate your exposure to glyphosate, you would go a long way to healing your leaky gut or to making it less likely that you would ever get a leaky gut uh, or dysbiosis. Now, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that anymore, but we're going to dive a little deeper into this here in a minute. But I did want to go back just for a second and kind of just cycle through all these, these things real quick. Because what I want you to think about, excuse me, going back to this, this um, our diverse and healthy ecosystem, you know, there we are, we have a nice natural vaginal birth, um, our mom is relatively healthy, you know, nurses us, so on and so forth. Um, there are still so many opportunities. Well, actually, I'm just going to cycle through these things real quick. And I want you to think about, if you can think of anybody that you know in your life that hasn't had multiple exposures to any of these things. So we have C-section, we have vaccinations, antibiotics, uh, over-sanitizing our world, fluoridated toothpaste and water, taking over, you know, taking over the counter, uh, NSAIDs, so ibuprofen, Aleve or Tylenol, aspirin, taking digestive problem drugs like, uh, anti-diarrheals or antacids, drinking chlorinated water or swimming in chlorinated pools on a regular basis, exposure to environmental pollutants in the air, or eating a high grain-based diet. Um, and don't even worry about this one because everybody's got this one. So really, I mean, as I started to dive into the causes and deep and really look to understand what's going on and why we're seeing this so much and why we're seeing this in our young, young children. It struck me. It's like, gosh, I don't really, I can't think of a single person that I know. I mean, maybe very, very few that don't have multiple, multiple exposures on a regular basis to these things. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are other things that influence and cause problems in our microbiome. This is just the most common exposures that we get. So you start to see a picture forming of why this is so rampant and why we're getting, you know, I'm getting comments from, um, you know, other people or, you know, you guys may be watching or, you know, people in this class of, you know, I took this class because my children have, uh, you know, ADHD or, or different problems going on. But I wonder if that's what's going on with me or uh, a person yesterday from yesterday's class was thinking, said that, but then said, I wonder if that's what's going on with my mom and, you know, we go to that multi-generational thing, right? The mom's gut has problems, the daughter, the daughter, the granddaughter, so on and so forth. And so, you know, the truth is, is that most everybody has some form of dysbiosis or another who lives in our modern day. And this right here, this image glyphosate is one of the big reasons why, even if you don't have many of those other exposures, that it's very difficult to have a properly functioning microbiome without doing it you know, specific coordinated strategic steps to, to heal your gut and maintain its health. So glyphosate, glyphosate, what have we done? So I mentioned, I think in, in lesson one or two, I'm not sure which, but at one of these times I know I've mentioned, but it, it bears mentioning again, you know, we talked about antibiotics and kind of people have a sense that antibiotics are tough on our digestive system. You know, we're 
often told that we should take probiotics after we have a round of antibiotics and so on and so forth. But glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is actually never been patented as an herbicide, though that's what it's used for. It's actually patented as an antibiotic. And the amount of this chemical, this antibiotic that gets dumped into the environment dwarfs the amount of antibiotics that are in um, not only prescribed by doctors, but even in our livestock. So doctors prescribe, I think it's about 7 million pounds of antibiotics a year in this country. Um, we have about 50 million pounds of antibiotics in the um, livestock, so cows, chickens, so on and so forth, which is ho huge. You know, in some cases, it's up to 40% by weight. Um, so like if you eat a conventionally raised hamburger, 40% by weight of that is uh, antibiotic. But that number is dwarfed by a factor of 100 by the amount of glyphosate that's dumped into the environment every year. So this is everywhere. It's in 75% of the rain that's measured around the country. 75% of the groundwater has glyphosate in it. It's ubiquitous. So here are some of the ways that glyphosate is a problem, particularly to our gut microbiome. So what it actually does when it's sprayed on fields of crops is it destroys the microbial ecosystem of the bacteria, fungi, and parasites in the soil. So not to get too sciencey about glyphosate, but it's worth understanding. And the reason why we're told that it's safe is that what it does is it interrupts a biochemical pathway um, called the shikimate pathway. Sorry, I just blanked on that. And what the shikimate, the shikimate pathway is a pathway that's in uh, plants that is a certain way that they create uh, amino acids to build their structure and so forth. So the idea is that since glyphosate only acts on the shikimate pathway, we don't have that as, um, as uh, humans. Only plants have that according to you know, the studies that are supposedly for safety. So it, it can't have an effect on us. But m microbes, bacteria, fungi, and parasites all also have shikimate pathways, and they're um, function of their body. So when it gets sprayed on fields, it, there's a rich, before that, there's a rich, diverse ecosystem in the soil that's much more diverse than even what's in our bodies. But a lot of those microbes get destroyed by the glyphosate directly. And then what ends up happening is, because it's the shikimate pathway is getting interrupted, either they're selectively spraying, meaning like spraying between the rows of crops to try to just kill the uh, weeds, but there's some, uh, of course, exposure by the crops as well, or even worse, GMO crops that are made to be uh, resistant to Roundup, Roundup Ready, they call it. Um, what, they, what glyphosate does in the plant is it blocks the um, nutrient delivery. So the nutrients that the plants are supposed to be pulling out of the soil get blocked, uh, and then the crops are sicker, less healthy, and they require more chemical fertilizers and then more herbicides and pesticides because an unhealthy plant is more uh, vulnerable to weeds taking over and to you know bugs and disease. Um, and it's also not growing as readily, so chemical fertilizers are added. But also in that, the, one of the things that ends up happening is the alkaloid compounds in plants get blocked. And why I'm bringing that up is that in plants, we understand that a lot of plants have natural uh, compounds in them that are medicinal. Like you might have heard about, uh, yeah, sorry, I've just seen this comment here, we're all doomed. Kind of, <laughs> you know. Um, when I was at this conference uh, where I was, where there were a lot of people talking about these different things, I was telling somebody, it's like half the time I was like, oh, you know, oh man. And then at half the time I'm like, oh man, you know, like I'm like half the time it's like, oh my gosh, like what are like all this amazing information and gives us, you know, hope of what we can do. And then, oh my gosh, like all the things we're doing to ourselves and our kids and our environment. So we have a chance to intervene, you know, the window's getting smaller and smaller, but, but keep in mind that glyphosate's only been around for about 30 years too. So all the damage we've done and, and uh, antibiotics have only been widespread used for like 60 years. So all the damage that we've done, though massive and widespread has only been in this series of a couple of generations which should mean that if we can reverse things and change course, that we should be able to get back to correcting it much easier than to have these things been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
So back to the alkaloid compounds. So all of those medicinal properties in plants, you know, this special stuff in broccoli that helps reduce cancers and all these things are actually the alkaloid compounds. You know, when we find medicinal chemicals in plants, they're the alkaloid compounds. And that's directly what glyphosate blocks. So you can have a broccoli that looks like a healthy and green and all this stuff, but it's devoid of its alkaloid compounds. So it's actually devoid of those very medicinal properties that would actually help us to heal from the problems that the glyphosate's causing. And then in our own gut, it eliminates the microbiome diversity because, you know, if we're ingesting it as the residue is on all these foods, um, you know, it gets in there and starts breaking up the shikimate pathway of our own microbiome and uh, it starts di directly killing our microbiome. Loss of our microbiome genomic diversity leads to loss of proper control of human genomic expression. So as our microbiome becomes less diverse, what, we, what happens is, is that there are special microbes that are a microbiota that have special communication um, interactions with our immune system and with the cells of our body that actually help to mitigate or eliminate the effects of uh, or the uh, risks of different cancers and stuff. And so as we start to lose the diversity of our microbiome, we actually aren't able to express certain genes in our own human genome. And then back to what we were talking about yesterday, um, glyphosate also directly erodes the tight junctions in our gut lining and the numerous other tight junction uh, tissues, so kidney, brain, blood vessels, etc., leading to chronic systemic inflammation and then eventually to autoimmunity. And that's kind of where um, we go. So it's it's immense you know um and mind-boggling and um you know it's hard to even have an inbox for how tremendously damaging glyphosate ha is on our our larger ecosystem and our own personal ecosystem and you know i was joking with my wife uh when i got home from this conference that i was at where i learned uh some of the latest research in glyphosate and uh, some of these connections and there was also um, some chiropractic neurology there. And I was telling her, you know, if I could sum up everything I learned in, in two sentences, it would be play outside barefoot with friends and eat organic only, like your life depends on it, because it does. So I know that can be tough. You know, organic foods in some areas of the country are very expensive. But, hey, there's a much cheaper way to get organic foods, and that's to grow it yourself. Um, and then there's also, uh, yeah, hard to listen to this and not feel depressed. I get you. I'm, I'm with you, you know, and, uh, but keep in mind that we're part of the solution right now because we're learning about this and trying to understand what's going on so we can make good decisions and, you know, get out of the, the matrix of being lied to by the chemical industry. Um, don't worry. We'll get to what we do about all this stuff aside from just avoiding it. But but avoid it. Avoid glyphosate. They don't put glyphosate on organic produce. They don't give antibiotics to organic uh, animals raised organically. Grow your own food. Because growing your own food is great. You get outside, so vitamin D. You get on the soil. Even better if you're barefoot. You get grounding from the earth. You get to absorb microbes. Breathe deeply when you're out there. Get your hands in the dirt. Microbial diversity, you know, uh, compost. You can compost easily um, at home and uh, grow food and then get your kids out there and have them help. Not only do they get the uh, microbial exposure by breathing in, getting their hands in the dirt, playing in mud puddles like that kid we saw at the beginning, but believe it or not, if a kid grows a vegetable, they're much more likely to eat it, you know, because I know picky eating is something we run into with our uh, kids uh, also these days. So that's the deal. Stay tuned. I know we're, let's see, is upsetting about glyphosate as I'm cutting up tons of non-organic spurgeals. Yeah, I hear you. Well, you know, we're, we are where we are when we're there. And all we can do is the best we can do with the information we're given, right? So, um, you know, we've all been doing our best. You know, it's like I think about, well, I mean, like for me, right? Um, I wasn't a C-section, luckily, birth when I was a baby, but I was uh, induced because I was two weeks late, and I'm making air quotes around the word late, 
and that throws things out of whack in terms of the neurology. Uh, puts a lot of stress on the baby's head and neck, mine in this case. Uh, and then when I was born, you know, there was a big push in the in so-called modern medical world to uh, have women not breastfeed their kids and have them give them formula. And so my parents, thinking that that was healthier, like isn't that insane in a certain sense that we think our science brains are so big and smart that we could be smarter than nature and what we create in a lab would be healthier than what, you know, nature creates. Anyway, so they did that. But um, my sister had had an allergic reaction, who's two years older, had had an allergic reaction to uh, cow's milk. And so they just didn't keep it in the house. Uh, and so um, they gave me soy formula, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that's got its own problems. But But even back then, they didn't understand the prebiotics, which at least now some, um, formulas have, right? So, you know, I mean, I was fed like some of the worst food at the, this important stage of life. Uh, so, you know, we are, but, but my point in saying that is my parents weren't trying to do something harmful to me. They were trying to do the best they knew how they were trying to follow the advice of the people who they relied on to give them good information. And, uh, you know, we are where we are. So don't worry, we'll pull out of this as we go along in our seven days, but we have to kind of go through the mud to get to the light on the other side.